Coming up in Arts World, dance fusions from Jordan, flamenco beats in Argentina, and cutting it fine in the Big Apple. Are you ready? But first, Arts World visits Amsterdam to get an insider's perspective on the country's art scene. Hello and welcome to Arts World. My name is Hanneke Schotz and this A right next to me is the A for Arts World, but it's also the A for Amsterdam, which happens to be my hometown. And I'm really proud to say it's famous for its art and design. In our first story, we're going to look at how designing letters actually can help change people's attitudes. I'm a writer and I love reading. And for me, letters are also by themselves a very beautiful abstract thing. I think they're a fine balance between poetry and graphic design. There's something about it that's very physical and it reminds me of dance, but it's silent. It's, it's music inside your head. We want to design this, this dancing plants, as I call it, these dancing language structures, also for two-dimensional use. On a farm north of Amsterdam, a group of designers are getting a rare chance to meet up in person. What's the difference between Amsterdam and Dubai? Yeah. And Arabic and Western and you and me. They're all members of a vibrant online community of more than 1,600 designers, all interested in design collaborations between Europe and the Middle East. For the past maybe 40 years, we've been looking to the West for design inspiration, whereas our heritage is really full of it. And then there's a demand in the market. Everybody, even if they don't read Arabic very well, they still want to see it written in Arabic because it's, again, this, this um, reassertion of our identity as Arabs. What ties all Islamic applied arts is the script, the writing. When you see text, Arabic text, you immediately know you are in an Islamic country. And when you learn how people write and how they organize visual material, you also gain an insight into the culture. Most bilingual design projects in the Middle East start in English and then get translated. But because there are no matches between Arabic and Latin fonts, this is problematic. If you put these two writing systems together, what is the readability of it? What is the beauty of it, the poetry of it? So the idea is to create new fonts from scratch that work both in Latin and Arabic. But what I think is interesting in the whole the history of topography, the, the experimenting or the, the moving away from original classical type has been always like, how far can I destroy it yeah. in order to create something new? Yeah. In letter forms like this, when you twist it, there will be one moment you recognize the K, yeah. and all the other moments it is just a three-dimensional shape. The big thing is that the Arabic has these very simple forms with little gestures. With Latin, it has far more rigid rules and, and ac acceptance of, you know, this is an A, and it's very yeah. similar to many ones. Whereas in Arabic, you can have uh, the same letter in so many different styles. It's always almost incredible that us Arabs can actually read the script. Huda set up the Khat Foundation as a non-profit platform for innovative design projects which can then partner with business to make these projects into viable products. The word khat sums up the aims of the foundation. It's the word for writing, it's the word for calligraphy, it's the word for script, but it also means a line. And I thought, oh, this is kind of interesting because a line is also the same. You can take a line and you can write with it, you can draw with it, you can make abstract things. So it had all these nice connotations and it was pronounceable in Dutch. <laughs> And, and very recognizable everywhere else in the Middle East. I can't I'm wait for the key. For the yeah, me too. <laughs> Some of the earlier Dutch Arabic collaborations have gone on to win design awards. They also came to the attention of the Dutch people when they rebranded a popular Dutch department store using Arabic fonts on everyday products. El Hema is a project that is able to bind people because it's just a, a, a funny project and it is not political, uh, it has nothing to do with religion. 
the thing we're trying to do here is really a fusion between the Arabic world and the Western world. Yeah. And we try everything to put a small joke in it. Yeah. It's written in Arabic kosher. And here on the back you have halal in Hebrew. Yeah. And I had a lot of people from Israel who bought also three for the Palestinian friends. It's kind of nice to see that the work we do also changes the way people think about their, their field and encourages them to develop new things. We've just seen that design can build bridges between cultures, but so can dance. In Jordan, there's a dance teacher who loves to combine modern dance with traditional Arabic elements. Let's go and have a look. It's a new form of, of art here, still relative to theater and music. I've had some experiences along the way where I've been not been able to use a certain hall because the director thinks that dance is useless and should never be, uh, should never be taught or performed. In 1992, when Kamhawi began performing in the kingdom, conservative politicians banned men from watching schoolgirl athletes and dancers perform in public. But Jordan has come a long way. All little girls want to be ballerinas. So that's been a driving force behind the growth of dance here. And we offer students dance from the age of four upwards. These mothers shuttle their daughters to classes twice a week. Most families enjoy traditional Arab folkloric dances at home but many are now encouraging their daughters to learn the art of Western dance as well. Nine-year-old Anoud Al-Khatib learned the Arab dances in the living room with her mother, but now prefers ballet. I would like to be a ballerina when I grow up. I like dancing. Anoud's mom, Rana, is very supportive. I really want her to become a ballerina. Her older sister is a gymnast in the national team. We're in an age where people are more open-minded. Her father, me, everyone. As long as it's kept decent, as a girl, she won't be looked down upon in our society. Despite the growing number of girls taking ballet, it is folkloric dance in contemporary form that is Kamhawi's passion. These are quite minimalistic movements. And maybe if they're developed a bit more, I would like to see what comes out of them. I took in like a wahda al which is the base of, of Dabke, and made it bigger, or played around with its direction. So traditional dances tend to be more about um, celebrations. It's a community dance, but it's been a tradition that's been going on for hundreds of years. In some performances, modern dance is choreographed to classic Arabic songs. I started toying with the idea of infusing contemporary dance to Um Kulthum's in Ta'umri. And, and I wanted to see the audience's response to that, how would they take it. And um, in 96 we produced it, and it, had, it was met with wide acclaim, people loved it. Kamhawi's effort to introduce modern dance has met resistance from certain segments of Jordanian society. Of course we're going to have problems because it is a conservative society. Yes, we will have problems. We'll probably have people that say, OK, we don't want this form of art. We don't appreciate it. We don't like the fact that women get up on stage and move their bodies, you know. Um, because dance is based on the body moving, you do have to be culturally aware of the sensitivities and the Islamic sensitivities as well. You need to be more aware of, for example, the costumes of the dancers and what they're wearing. Theatre performances infused with dance became another way for Kamhawi to integrate dance into the national art scene. You have to engage people. 
uh, on quite a serious themes. Most of our themes are about, um, you know, um, uh, children at war. It's about um, uh, protection of the environment. You know, quite sophisticated themes, and you have to bring it uh, to life in front of people using dance and music. If dance is to get a proper foothold in Jordan, there needs to be a place for professional dancers like Amhawi. See, dance here is not a career yet. You can't say, oh, this is my profession and this is how I'm going to make my money and my daily bread. It's not going to work. But the climate for dance in Jordan is clearly changing. I am so convinced that dance has so much to offer. And I'm so convinced that our culture is so full of um, stories and things you can draw on to present fantastic performances. Now don't go away, because after the break we'll be back with some Flamengo music all the way from South America. Welcome back to Arts World. We're at the End Days Enver, which is a cultural hotspot for artists collaborating on their projects, which often have a multicultural feeling to it. But for our next story, we're going to follow a group of Spanish gypsies who are really holding on tight to their own traditions, although they have been living in Argentina for decades already. Avenida de Mayo is one of Buenos Aires' most famous streets in a neighborhood known for its old Spanish-style cafes. It's also the part of town where on any given night you can hear not the sound of tango, but of flamenco. The sound of gypsies. Nineteen-year-old Eugenio Romero was born in Argentina, but like his cousins who sing and play with him in this bar, he looks and sounds as though he had just got off the plane from Caño Roto in Madrid. It's the part of Spain from where many of the gypsies who migrated to Argentina in the last 50 years come from. With pride, Baldomero Cadiz and his brother-in-law, Emilio Romero, watch their sons and nephews play. They too are musicians. They all form part of a clan that lives and breathes for two things, the preservation of its gypsy heritage and the flamenco. We don't read people's palms or live in tents. That's not what makes us gypsies. The gypsy is born with this art inside of him. If you say gypsy, you say flamenco. If you say flamenco, you say gypsy. That's the way it is. From childhood, our sons learn to clap their hands. They try to imitate us, and that's how they grow up. A gypsy is always singing. The majority wear their hair long and speak with a Spanish accent, even the ones who've never lived outside of Argentina. We don't lose the accent because we are always together. We don't mix much with the peos, the people who are not gypsies. In Argentina, gypsy children are taken out of school just before they reach puberty. Some carry on with private tutoring at home, but most don't. I am a bit embarrassed to say that I only studied until the fourth grade. Then I left so that I wouldn't lose our customs. You can lose your culture by staying in school with people who think and live differently from us. Like most of his clan, Eugenio and his cousin Juan live around Avenida de Mayo. Almost every afternoon, the men come here to play tarot cards with beans, a typical gypsy card game. It is strictly for men. Gypsy girls and women do not go to public places like these, or to discotheques, or to the clubs where the men play flamenco. Eugenio's father insists it's to protect them from being bothered by payos. Some say it's male chauvinism, but that's just the way we're brought up. I can't marry a woman who is not a gypsy, nor can my son. If he does, he loses his family. 
where gypsies of all ages and genders do gather, is here. Every evening they go to this Pentecostal church. Even here, the music is flamenco, but cameras are not allowed anywhere near the service. It is as much a place for teenagers to flirt and get to know each other as it is to worship. Gypsies marry very young. During these public performances, the women dancers are Argentine, not gypsies, who in this country do not sing and dance for the public. Argentina Cadiz is the exception. She and her husband, Emilio, are the most famous of the gypsy flamenco artists. Why does she sing in public? First, because she sings very well. And secondly, because I am her husband and I allow her to. We work very well together. Argentina guards her privacy jealously, but cannot resist bragging that she's never had a singing lesson in her life. Since I can remember, I've sung. For me, it's not something you learn, it's something you're born with. For Eugenio, too, music is inseparable from his identity as a gypsy. The flamenco is something you live, it is life. Ever since I was small, I heard it, and every day I like it more. But Eugenio is working to create his own sound, a fusion of flamenco with jazz. They dream of success and recognition here in Argentina, but without ever renouncing their roots. It's in the air, in the gestures, in the way of walking, of talking. You can tell when you see a gypsy, and that's something to be proud of. Now, where do you draw the line between art and graffiti, between art and vandalism? A person who for sure has a very strong opinion about this is called Poster Boy. He's a New York artist who only uses two tools, his imagination and a razor blade. A healthy uh, dose of political statements, anti-consumerism and humor. Like a masked Avenger, someone to save the day. I don't mind that. I used to read comic books. I can dig that. Hey, this is Poster Boy. Welcome to New York. There is a new face that has burst onto the New York City art scene. People call him the anti-consumerist Zorro, with a razor blade. His work is all over New York, a city caught up in the midst of a global economic meltdown, in a country going through massive political shifts. Preferring to remain anonymous, this anti-hero lets his art speak for itself. Poster Boy cuts out letters and images from the advertising posters in New York's subways. He then rearranges them to create his very own cut and paste punk aesthetic. In the subways, they're like giant vinyl stickers and they retain their adhesive, so when, when you cut into them, you cut out a specific part, you can repaste them onto another surface. It makes it easy to do collage right there, so my tool in the subway is my razor blade alone, nothing else. More and more of these redesigned posters have been appearing in the subway, creating a public gallery of guerrilla art. The satire created by Poster Boy in the posters is often as sharp as the razor blade he uses. As long as you have human beings living on this planet, there's always gonna be issues and drama to address. Sometimes you make the most powerful political statements through humor and vice versa. You can make an ass of yourself and be funny making a political statement, so I like to include everything. But Poster Boy is not just one individual. My idea of Poster Boy is as a collective, I'd like it to be as decentralized as possible. You know, we don't have meetings and no one gives any orders or takes any orders. It's just whoever is willing to take up a razor for the cause. I set guidelines personally for myself when I go out and do the Poster Boy stuff. I don't, I don't damage people's personal property. I try to keep it as public as possible. I was not scared the first time. Climb up, cut it down, come down, and take off. Well, it wasn't me. <laughs> and I don't even know most of the people that uh, take part in Poster Boy. It's just random acts of uh, vandalism or art, whatever, you, whatever your viewpoint is. It's without my permission and it's posted on the internet or 
and magazines. Some of it's not mine, but it's all Poster Boy in my opinion. Poster Boy is preparing for an exhibition in this alternative art gallery in New Jersey. He explains why being anonymous is important to him. If I was given this interview, I had, you know, my face on camera, well then people would probably feel less likely to take it up and uh, participate because then it'd be, it'd be, it would be about me. But if I stay anonymous, they'd feel a little more inclined to take up a raise themselves. I also conceal my identity because of arrest too because some of the stuff is worth a lot of money. And what I'm standing on right now is probably a few thousand dollars. But despite the legality questions that inevitably surround Poster Boy, his ideas grow out of a belief in something good for the public at large. The advertisement is there, it's public, it's in your face. You know, you can't, you can, it's not like you can choose to look away. I mean, it's, it, it's embedded in your subconscious. You walk by it every day to go to work or go home and people can't choose to turn off. It's different from like a magazine that you can close or a TV you can shut off. The stuff, like I said, is in your face and most of these advertisers and firms, they probably don't even live in the places they put up the billboards and advertisements. They don't allow the public to interact with those same spaces that they pay for, so I, seem, I think that's a little unfair. What I try to say with the posters, it depends on what's available on a platform or the text that's available, depending on the imagery that's available. What I can appropriate is such an easy target. And depending on what you say specifically, depends on what words are available, what words you can physically make. Because then you start making the work for other people, worrying about what the hell they think. You can't do that. So this man's art is another man's vandalism. But he continues to have an unwavering belief in what he is doing. I want today to exist as an idea of what is possible when the intent is true and pure as far as art is concerned, or other things, but, yeah. Well, that's it for me here in Amsterdam. Thank you for watching Arts World. Take good care of yourself, or as we say in Dutch, pas goed op jezelf. Dag! <laughs>